But we are continuing with our sermon series today. If we finish today, we'll be three parts into this four-part sermon series. And it is as worthy of an exclamation point or leaving a mark. And, and we've been saying this simply that the exclamation point is what? It's just simply this sharp or sudden utterance or vehement expression or protest or complaint. You know, words that shout out like, wow, when we see something pretty exciting. Or ouch, when you hurt yourself. Or no way. Or oh, or awesome. Yay. Or boo. I was watching Affiliate game yesterday and there was a bad call. I don't know if Joe you saw it and all you hear the crowd go boo when they hear something they don't like or yikes. But these are things that warrant a mark that leave an exclamation point. Something that you exclaim in this utterance but it's something that as we've been saying through this sermon series though the purpose or main point for it is four stories that we're looking at over four weeks that we hope leave a mark in our lives. And we've already been kind of singing about this already, about that abide that Lori had brought as that song. It's a beautiful one of a reminder of what we looked at it when, when Jesus with his disciples were in that upper room to celebrate what? To celebrate Passover. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. But it's there he, he shares those verses in John 15 about being attached to the vine and how important that's for to be action in it or to be cut. And we said that two paths really for all of us then is to remain with the vine connected to him and Jesus in action, meaning bearing fruit for him or be cut off. And Lori said, if you look around, I, I had in my own yard some dead branches that I ran over with the lawnmower this week and there's no growth on those because they're disconnected from the actual vine or the tree itself. But they're the choices that we looked at that first week. And then last week, as we kind of tied in the, the Ascension Sunday and up, up and away, kind of that line, the explanation that Superman used to say. And we said we looked at the 40 days after Easter that we are kind of called, yes, we know Jesus ascended into heaven, and so naturally we want to look up and away, but we don't want to look at Jesus as being far away in our lives. But the reality for all of us is to start having Jesus in, work in us, and through us with that. And we talk about today the Holy Spirit that Jesus gives to us. Now, the title of today's message is Holy Smokes. Have you ever heard that old expression? Holy Smokes! That's kind of one you could leave a mark or put afterwards. Well, let's talk about smoke signals for a little bit, shall we? Understanding the signals. Do you know, at Cambridge University, they have listed different smoke signals and their meanings. And to take a look at some of them, if you have a slender, pale column of smoke going up, it means an accident or sickness has occurred. Two unbroken columns are ascending up, you have danger of approaching or nearby. A heavy, thick, white column sent at a distance means a death has occurred. A heavy, thick, white column sent nearby is a tribe wants to have a friendly talk or visit. And you can look at the rest of them. Regularly broken column, a different meaning, slender, dark column, black column. And it occurred to me after looking at all those, I'm a camper. And I think I've built every one of those and sent a smoke signal up with all kinds of different meanings. And I just wonder if there's anyone that was around, saw my fire smoke going up, if I was sending out some of wrong message. Sending up smoke signals. Where today we're looking at signals of what we call this Holy Spirit. It's one of those in many church circles where people, oh, especially those that might be found in the holiness tradition where our church has come from, we don't talk about the Holy Spirit much. We don't look at, we're not Pentecostals. But there's something to look at some of the signals given to us of the coming of the Holy Spirit that we're going to look at today. One that the Holy Spirit in Scripture is recognized as this wind or, or smoke that comes down upon the uh, people, and that's Acts chapter 2, verse 1, and also verse 19. And in my time, I've only ever seen what I would describe as like the wind from heaven that actually came down. On a mission trip when we were in Venezuela, we were in a home and a woman that seemed to have an evil spirit living within her, and, and we came and we gathered around her, and we prayed over her for a long time. And it was a rather uh, a difficult experience and she was uh, speaking and even my translator that, would, that knew the Spanish was translating for me and when we were laying hands upon her then too the translator got eyes as big and it was like one of those holy smokes moments like I said because she's not speaking Spanish which really freaked us all out that we're there but while we're in that home and understand too that she was making lunch but she didn't care about her lunch and she had chicken on the stove that caught fire and the whole home was beginning to fill with look at this smoke and, and, and I went over to the kitchen area to kind of put that fire out. And when I was there, understand that the windows and doors there had no windows and there were no doors. There were just simply curtains there. 
and, and, and I remember putting the lid on the fire and it went out and I remember stepping outside I was pretty sweaty on that day it wasn't even all that hot but I just remember praying oh Lord like this woman needs your help and, and, and suddenly and I can say it's only happened one time in my life where it, the house was at the base of a mountain it was a big mountain that you could just barely see the top of. And you just saw this wind that came down, and you saw the trees move. It came in through the house. The curtains in the doorway and the windows just blew open, and it came into the room, and this woman goes, oh, and she just jumps like that. We were freaked out. I'm not going to lie to you. I wish I would say, like, I had this all together, and I walked out of that house thinking, but it was something I will never forget. And it was, seemed like that wind was so purposeful, and I would like to say I'd like to recreate that and be able to do that wherever I go, but I just know it was a spirit that seemed to be working and needed to touch this woman's life. Crazy, one of the craziest things I'd ever seen. It was a wow moment for me. I sat there and watched the wind, and I watched her body jump, and I was like, wow. And all I could say was praise God. Praise God. See, that's the kind of stories. You know, oh, those are creepy stories. Holy Spirit, crazy stuff, Pentecostal stuff. We don't talk about that kind of stuff here. Why not? Because something that we encountered or I had encountered that I do share occasionally with people, and it was one of those moments that when we walked out of that house, all of us were covered in sweat. And it's almost like that story in, in the book of Acts where you know, the, the, the evil spirit says, oh, Jesus we know, Paul we know, but we don't know you guys. And he beats up all these Jewish. We felt like we were beat up when we went out of that house. And I openly said, Lord, I don't know if I handled that right, but it, I was glad to be present in that, in that moment with you. But you see, the Holy Spirit can be recognized as the wind or a smoke. Also, we say Jesus' baptism. At two occasions, and two, we're told this flame or fire. That's where we get this sense of the red stuff you see going on up here with the geraniums and even the altar coverings and stuff are in the red to represent this Holy Spirit coming on, a flame or a fire. Even at Jesus' spirit, we sometimes say the spirit came like a dove, like when we began the service today. Also, when we look at our story today in Acts 2, uh, verse 3, it's this, this tongue of, of fire, tongues of fire that come down and land on the apostles. These are signals of the Holy Spirit. And you ever see those go up or things that you even see mentioned today that we're talking about. But also understanding Pentecost, that we celebrate that today, that what was happening on this event we're about to look at in Acts chapter 2. In the Old Testament, there was this festival or this feast of weeks. It's a Jewish holiday, a Shavuot that was required or, or to happen. And look at this, 50 days after Passover. Pentecost, that's where that word comes from. Penta, 5, 50, 50 days where this feast actually occurs. And it's interesting that when you look at this, and you go back to Levitical law, and it actually makes it pretty clear here about what this festival or feast was all about. Leviticus chapter 23, 15 to 17, it says, From the day after the Sabbath, the day you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, count off seven full weeks. What's seven times seven? Hey, you guys, remember your math, 49 plus one day. Count off 50 days up to the day after the seventh Sabbath, and then present an offering of, look at this, new grain to the Lord new grain that's being actually presented there in that Levitical law was to be happening in the city of Jerusalem that day. This is why the people had gathered. And yet Luke, in, in the gospel, and now we see this happening in, in the book of Acts, he kind of talks to this about the, the fulfillment in Acts 2-1 of Pentecost with the Holy Spirit. That's a fulfilling of these things. And, and if you recall in that first week when we talked about the Passover, remember that story? It's the same night where Jesus will be arrested and die on the cross, which we sang about today, for our sins. And yet the, the, the fulfillment of, of the Passover, and you remember that event where Moses is leading the nation of Israel out of Egypt. They had to get out. And, and the God's last curse or plague among the people of, of Egypt was that if you don't let these people go, your firstborn sons are going to die. And God gives this thing, look, cover your door frames with the blood of the Lamb. And as that spirit goes through, the spirit of God goes through that town, any door that's marked with the blood, it will what? Pass over that door. As a fulfillment of that, we have Christ who died on the cross that any person that has the blood of the lamb on their lives, like on their doorposts of who they are, what happens? Our sins are forgiven because Christ died for our sins. 
the spirit of death passes over us and we can go into new life in his resurrection. And we celebrate in that. That's what we've been talking about these couple weeks. But then, even in that Old Testament time, they had that festival in Jerusalem. And then 50 days go by and they celebrate this feast. The Feast of Weeks, 49 plus 1, 50 days. And it's this new grain offering. And we're going to see this new life being birthed into it. The start of the church through this coming of this new one. So you could say, as Luke said, it's the fulfillment of the things even in the Old Testament in the New. And it's interesting. I heard that or read this this week, actually, about Jerusalem. Because when I've talked about the Passover event, and even on Holy Thursday, we say the city of Jerusalem for the Passover was just full to capacity. And, and, and then I had I'd read this this week and said it really hit me. But the time of year for that would have been difficult for all those that were required to come because the weather was bad for travel. Who likes to travel in bad weather? If there is a blizzard on the forecast, hey, let's hop in the car, pound the family, we're going to, to have fun. Usually that's when you say, no, we're going to stay right where we are. And in this story of, on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after Easter, 50 days after that Passover festival, the weather is much better. And we get this sense that the town of Jerusalem was even fuller than what it was. So many came from around the ancient Near Eastern world to celebrate. It was easier for them to get there. Most of us, a lot of us, do our travel in the summertime when the weather is a lot nicer to be able to go somewhere else. Well, then expect Jerusalem to be even fuller than what it was when the Passover came. And understand that the event that we're about to look at was a one-time event in this manner when the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. And we're looking at Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 40 in the NIV today. It says the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost came, that's 50 days after that Passover, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews, look at this, every nation under heaven. That makes sense, right? Because everyone had been coming for this pilgrimage. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one, listen to this, each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed. Holy smokes, they shouted. No, I added that. But utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians. Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own language or our own tongues. Exclamation point. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? What does this mean? Oh, but some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. What's your reaction to hearing that story? Wow. Uh, I don't know. That's awesome. Boo. Yikes. Yay. What comes to your mind? What's your reaction when you hear this? Because those that were present from all around the ancient Near Eastern world who got to travel there were utterly amazed, shocked, and they shouted things out that, that left a mark. Holy smokes, what's going on here? As if they were fair. Because this holy smoke, this wind from heaven and tongues of fire came upon the apostles. It landed upon them. And they began to speak in what? Tongues. Now, now, you know, people in the Holy Spirit and their tongues speaking, this is fascinating because they don't just speak gibberish. 
and sometimes I think this is where an abuse can happen in, in the church, but they began to speak in tongues languages of all those in town. Here's a shocker. It was the Galileans that were doing it. You know, the bumpkins. Those from the fishing town. And they would have been shocked to hear these guys. Wait, wait, wait a minute. I hear my language perfectly. But it's these country bumpkins, these Galileans that are doing it. What's going on here? Wow, this is awesome. What, how could they possibly? And, and each of them were speaking about the wonders of God perfectly, by the way. Have you ever tried to speak a foreign language? Have you ever tried to do it perfectly? You, you can hear people speak a foreign language who are learning the language and they need correcting and help. You know, may go out and buy the Rosetta Stone. That's like one of those things you can learn a foreign language in. Or maybe, here's an interesting too, Whitecliffe, the Bible translators. Was anyone part of our church back when we used to go down south and, and go to Whitecliffe? Anyone went on that mission trip? All right, Rick Kopp was there for that. And, and Rick, don't they, don't they like spend like years translating like, you know, the Bible into different languages? I think what's exciting and surprising is that these people had no training, no classes. And, and he's hearing these Galileans speaking perfectly the languages of these people from all over the place, all these nations. And, and, if, and, and if you've never done this, if you, like when I was talking about my mission trip to Venezuela, there was a time when, when, um, when we were at the airport ready to come home. And, and it was a, a, you know, just a wonderful trip, and we had translators with us the whole time. When we get into the airport to leave, we get on our plane, we're like, yay, we're going home. And then something bumped into the airplane. And we're sitting in the plane, and boom, and the whole plane moves like this. And I remember Ken Cole, who used to go here, said, that didn't sound good. And we were all asked to get off the plane. Now in the airport, none of us spoke Spanish. No one could speak Spanish. It was getting lunchtime. Oh, we're hungry. And I remember a twin brother and I going to the place to order in the airport, and we couldn't order any food because we didn't know any of the language. And I wish the Holy Spirit would have come on me and I could have ordered an empanada with cheese and beans or whatever I needed to order, but it didn't happen that way, and it was a struggle. But yet, on this Holy Spirit day, understand that the language fell, the tongues fell on all these different people and they could hear perfectly their native language. Pretty impressive. And I also thought about it in my own life, too, uh, for studying and going to seminary. I spent two summers, one summer with Greek and one summer with Hebrew. And I spent days, weeks, months studying day in and day out to conjugate verbs and walked around all summer. I was even at the Creation Musical Festival with the kids with flashcards, learning language. And, 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 and by the end of the semester, I could read maybe Greek and Hebrew and I could speak a little. But I studied, I mean, intently all summer. Here they are. Not a single lesson. Think how crazy this sounded. But they spoke it perfectly. And they understood because they were speaking of God's wonders. A unique experience here where every one of their tongues were enabled to speak and everyone heard the language. Amazed and perplexed. I mean, th that would just be crazy, wouldn't it? Amazed and perplexed, they ask, what does this mean? What does this mean? And the fulfillment of the Old Testament, it's something new that's happening here. And, and I think it's, it's the beginning of the Christian church. Consider that the, the beginning of the Christian church is being launched here in this Pentecost festival where the Spirit lands and these people are hearing this amazing, the beginning of the church. But here's something else. Is it possible some will still make fun of you too if you're trying to spread the word of God? Because they made it clear, hey, they've had too much wine, they're drunk is what came out of some. And I think what's important about this, or just hearing this as a church today, is we sometimes think that God's doing something with this, that everyone's just going to fall in line. But even on Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit actually came, and this crazy event happened, that everyone hearing their native languages, there were still some there who said, they're drunk. This is not from God. This is craziness. Don't be shocked. Even if you're filled with the Spirit in your life, that some may still reject the message of God. 
And Scott, we were talking about this this week, maybe just think of this, about how people's ears are sometimes closed off from it. And they missed it. They weren't part of it. So we continue on then. This is just in response to that, you know, them being amazed and perplexed and asking, what does this mean? Even some saying about they had too much to drink. Then it's Peter addresses the crowd. Then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Good, because I want to know what the heck's going on. Wouldn't you? That's not written there. I'm at, this is Pastor Mark's commentary. Fellow Jews and all you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning! Exclamation point. Although today you could argue that some people even get drunk at nine in the morning. Verse 16. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Now, before we go on, it's interesting that he quotes a prophet here. And, and one thing about uh, prophetic literature is often there's this near and far component to the speaking. Isaiah chapter 9, the one we always read at Christmas time. For unto us a child is born, for us a son is given. But then we talk about for on his, his shoulders he'll carry on this a government and, and all these things, but it's like much later. And then we even talk about posts, like even when we're in heaven again. So there's this all within one little chapter, the near and the far those things that are happening, things that will, and things we're still waiting for. So understand, when you hear this from Joel, there are things that are happening, just what they just witnessed, but there are things in the far to come. So he says this, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire, there's that fire, and billows of smoke, there's some smoke signals. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs which God did among you through him as you yourselves know this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge and you with the help of wicked men put him to death by nailing him to the cross but God isn't that what we love that word I, I love it so many times in scriptures but but God raised him from the dead freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And David said about him, now we're going way back in the Old Testament, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices, my body will also rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with the joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him an oath and would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. They all saw it. Exalted, look at the ascension. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit. Now look at this. And has poured out what you now see and hear. They now see and hear that coming of the Holy Spirit. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Now when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? 
Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. Now, I like that, right? The promise is for them and their children and for all of us who are far off, maybe talking about us, and for all whom the Lord our God will call. Now, with many other words, and I wish I would have known what those were, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to the number that day. Whew. The first mega church. The first on the birth of the church. Boom! Mega church right there. Because of the Holy Spirit pours out upon those people. What's your reaction to that? Wow. Whew. Awesome. Yikes. Ouch. No way. What does this story do to our lives as believers? D.L. Moody, the great evangelist, said there is no better evangelist in the world than the Holy Spirit. Well, let's talk about Moody, shall we? And what's your mood to the Holy Spirit? No pun intended. Well, maybe a little. Because in the book of the life of D.L. Moody meant to remind us that being filled with the Spirit, that's Ephesians 5.18, should be our constant desire, prayer, and aim. The year 1871, that goes back a little while, was critical in one of Mr. Moody's career. He realized more and more how little he was fired by personal requirements for his work. I mean, he was running out of steam a little bit. That maybe after going and preaching for a while, maybe he was finished and went, eh. And we're going to tell you about that word for the last couple of weeks. Like, eh. Whew, that was rough. So he's kind of worn out a little fire, kind of put out. Maybe you see a fire ever go out. But an intense hunger and a thirst for spiritual power were aroused in him by two women who used to attend the meetings and sit on the front row. Now, when I hear that part of the story, I go, wow, people who sit in the front row? Because people like to cram in the back. But these two people, these two women, would sit in the front row. And he could see by the expression on their faces that they were praying. At the close of services, they would say to him, we have been praying for you. We have been praying for you. And Moody would ask them, why don't you pray for the people? And they would say to him, because you need the power of the Spirit. I need the Spirit or the power. Why? Moody said, in relating the incident, he, he said, you know, he's seen this type of thing. I thought I had power, he said. He said, I had the largest congregation in all of Chicago. And there were many conversions. And in one sense, he was very satisfied. But right along, these two godly women kept praying for me, and this is his own words, and their earnest talk about anointing for special service sent him thinking. And he said, I asked them to come and talk with me, and they poured out their hearts in prayer that I might receive the filling of the Holy Spirit. Well, they came at great hunger into my soul. I did not know what it was, and he said, I began to cry out, as I never did before. He had this hunger, and like this, he knew he was missing something. I really felt that I did not want to live if I could not have this power for the service for Jesus Christ. Then the book tells of the great Chicago fire happened, and D.L. Moody's relief work and his people at the church, the building of the North Side Tabernacle, and his visiting in the East to secure funds for his work. Then the narrative continues. And he said this, My heart was not in work of begging, he said. I could not appeal. I was crying out at the time that God would fill me with the Spirit. Well, then one day, in the city of New York, and he goes, oh, what a day! And if you read his book, or his quote, exclamation point. 
It left a mark in his life of what happened to him that day. And he goes on to say, I cannot describe it. I seldom refer to it, an almost too sacred an experience to name. Paul had an experience when he never spoke for 14 years. I can only say, Moody said, that God revealed himself to me. And I had such an experience of his love that I had to ask him to stay. And I went to go preaching again. And he went on to say, the sermons weren't any different. He did not present any new truths. And yet hundreds were converted at a time. Wow. I would now be placed back where I was before that blessed experience if he should ever give me all the world. He said he never wanted to lose the filling of the Holy Spirit in his life. He said it would be as a small dust of the balance that he would spend his days with the Holy Spirit residing in him. It's kind of like the wind that Holy Spirit. I shared that story in the beginning. I would have never thought it would have happened, but it did, and God moved in a powerful way. And I think about the church and where we are today. When Peter preached the message, which, by the way, I read to all of you, how many people came to that new church? Thousands that were asking, what shall we do to be saved? And thousands were saved that day and baptized, and the church was launched. Can I ask a question here? And it's a, it's a valid question. Was there anyone here today who asked the question, what must I do to be saved? Not a single person. That, that says something to me, and it's a little bit convicting, because I want to keep praying for the Holy Spirit to reside on us as a church for the work that we do for God so that people come to the Lord and ask what shall we do to be saved because we can do all the programs we want and we can do all the different things we want to make it look like it's the work of God but here's a better way to do it get the ship ready a sailboat it has to get the sails ready get the ship all ready and launch and what do they do then? Wait for the wind. Wait for the wind. I can't tell you. I would wish it was this Sunday where the doors would be flown open and the windows would be shut and the Spirit would just pour over all of us and that people around this community would know the Spirit is working here. But I don't know. But I can say this. The ship isn't going to go anywhere if it's not ready for the wind. So church, are you ready for the Holy Spirit to work in this place? I would love for the Holy Spirit to pour out over this place and on each of our lives so that we can make a real difference for God in this community. I'm waiting. And you can see why the Moody got the hunger stirring. Is anybody else in this place hungry for the Spirit? Anyone? We need the Spirit of God to move. We need the Spirit of God to move. Let's ask. Let's prepare ourselves for that. Would you pray with me, please? Father, for your Holy Spirit, we ask that you would come and pour out upon us as your people in this place, in this community. Lord, as you moved in the early church, we as your people want to see you move with your Spirit's power all the programs that we can do, all the things that we can do and add to our calendar are no different or not important without your Spirit's presence. So, Father, I pray for the Holy Spirit to come, to come and descend upon us as a church. Blow your fresh wind upon us. Light us on fire, God, that we can make a difference for your kingdom so that you would be glorified, O oh Lord, that the work that we would do be for your glory and for your honor. And we ask all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.